Um, I'm so glad to see you all. I just love your smiling faces. Glad you're here. Um, I want to give y'all a little bit of insight about, um, and we might, we're going to need some more chairs. Well, there's a couple right there. Um, yep, there's several, we, a few more coming. Um, a little insight um, into what's going on in the next few weeks. We're just putting out some more chairs, Megan. Um, so, we are going to do next week, since it's spring break. What? It's already spring break? Oh, no. This is crazy. It's going to out for two weeks, but it's still for weeks, and they haven't spring break yet. I know. It's absolutely insane. Hopefully, and so, spring break's going to be like last year. And spring break's early to me this year. I'm used to getting in like the middle of the month, so it's just crazy. But Tyler's the same way, too, right? They're coming next week. Um, yeah. Here comes some more. I don't know if they're staying in here or not. Thank y'all. Oh, good. There was some more out in the hall. Good. We've got a good group tonight. Come on in here. Uh, well, hi, lady. Um, are you just for anybody? You. For you? Yeah, we're just putting them out for more people. Um, so next Wednesday, since it's spring break, um, we are going to meet in with Charles's group. We're going to all meet together. Okay. Um, so we're doing that just next week. But then after that, every Wednesday until school's out, we'll be meeting right here, Songs of the Saints, okay? All the way up till summer. Then this summer, um, we'll all be together. We're not having meals this summer, by the way. No meals this summer. So it'll just be Bible, but we'll still have Bible study. We'll all be together again, okay? Um, and I think what we're going to do there is we're going to kind of take turns. Um, Charles is going to be starting a Bible study um, with a group of men that is, he's going to do a group and then maybe another time he'll do a different group. And that, so David Youngblood is going to teach in the sanctuary. So we have three things going on at once. Us ladies in here, David Youngblood in the sanctuary with whoever else goes in there, and Charles and a small group of men, both young and old, in with him in a special discipleship group. It's going to be really neat. So that's what we have going on. Um, so this summer we'll all be together again though. And then in the fall, I picked out our Bible study for the fall. And I'm not going to tell you what it is, but I'm going to tell you <laughs> it's going to be great. Get out of here. I will tell you all that I soon do want to get out of this area because <laughs> the comings and the goings, I just have to trust you all to pay attention even though a lot of comings and goings are happening. See, and he's making fun of me right, waving my arms. <laughs> so um, here comes Gary. <laughs> We're just going to stare at you. No. <laughs> that was between me and you. You ever had this many women stare at you at once? Kind of nice. Thank you. <laughs> So anyway, so that's kind of the deal. So I'm excited about next fall, and our women's ministry team is about to meet, and we're going to be coming up. We have a really neat event we're going to do in the spring and one in the fall. So hot dog, get ready. We're excited. Okay, tonight we're doing something a little different, but before we do, I want us to pray. Lord Jesus, we just come to you tonight. I just want to thank you so much for every single person who's here. Thank you for... The priority that each lady has put Bible study in her life today. And Lord, I pray that you'd speak to us, maybe like never before, speak to us through your word. Lord, we love you so much and we pray that you in your name. Amen. Guess what? Tonight's Bible study, if you've been coming to Songs of the Saints, every single one of the saints so far has been a female. female. And tonight, it's not a female, it's a male. Except I did Nehemiah when I did that. I did oh, that's Nehemiah. right. You did. did. You did. You did Nehemiah. That's right. I guess <coughs> the ones I've taught so far. Um, so anyway, tonight we do, we're doing that. Um, so I want you to be looking up in your Bible in Philippians. We're going to be in the book of Philippians, um, chapter 2. And while you're looking up Philippians, you know how to find Philippians, right? Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, God's Electric Power Company, <laughs> GAPC, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Okay, so, I didn't think about food. Go eat popcorn. Go eat popcorn, okay? <laughs> That'll work, but see, that would make me too hungry. I would be like, yes, let's have some. Um, 
So, Philippians chapter 2 is where we'll be tonight. And while you're flipping to Philippians, um, I thought I had mine marked. Yes, I do. Okay. I'm going to give you a little bit of background. Now, during this time, Paul, who is not the one we're going to be talking about, we're going to talk about him some, but the man we're going to be talking about tonight is Epaphroditus. Say that three times fast. <laughs> Epaphroditus. That's hard, isn't it? Yeah. Good job, Marie. <laughs> um, but during the time that we're going to be um, reading in Philippians, Paul was being imprisoned in Rome for preaching the gospel. Well, big surprise. Paul was imprisoned a lot, wasn't he? But this time he was on house arrest. And it really is just how it sounds. Usually the house arrest happened in little apartments called insulas. Insulas. And if you go to Rome today, you can go on a tour of a little insula. And I saw some pictures, and it was so neat. There were all these buildings built up, and then they have preserved these little insulas right outside these little rented apartments. But think about it. You had to pay and rent an apartment to be imprisoned. Isn't that crazy? Um, but Paul did have some liberties, but he was still in prison. He was still on house arrest. But people could come in and out to see him. Now, he was there for two years. But do you know that those two years that Paul was imprisoned in Rome were two of the most productive years of his ministry? And I'll tell you why. Well, first of all, during those two years, he wrote the prison epistles. And the prison epistles are exactly what I said a while ago, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, God's electric power company. He wrote those prison epistles, those letters, to the church in Gal Galatia, Philippi, Colossae, and Ephesus, okay? So he wrote these prison epistles during that two-year time. And then you don't have to look it up, but in Acts 28, 30 through 31, it talks about this time when Paul's in prison. And it says, and he stayed two full years in his own rented quarters and was welcoming all who came to him. So we know he could have guests. Preaching the kingdom of God and teaching concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all openness unhindered. That's what the scripture says. That he preached with all openness unhindered. He was in prison preaching with all openness. I say wow to that. Also, in Philippians 1, and we're not, you don't have to look at that right now, but you can trust me. In Philippians 1, verses 13 and 14, the, the chapter just before what we're going to be reading about, Paul tells us that the entire Roman imperial guard knew and had heard about why Paul was in prison. So he was a witness to the entire Roman imperial guard and that many of the brethren, so we know brethren, his brothers and sisters in Christ, were able to share the gospel with more courage because they knew what he was going through and that he was being so effective while in prison. So if you want to look at that later and see what it was like, look at Philippians 1, 13 and 14 later. Now I want you to think about something. Has God ever used a time of seeming imprisonment in your life to make you productive for him? Let me say that again. Has God ever used a time of seeming imprisonment in your life to make you productive for him or maybe more productive for him? Is he doing that now? And I wish we had time to go around and everyone share yes, because I think many of us could share yes. But I thought of an example, and actually an example was presented to me this week when I was thinking about this, and it's Mary's sister, Dawn. Dana. What? Dana. I said Dawn. Dana. Dana is going through a really hard bout and has been with cancer. Yet this week, there was a beautiful video on Facebook produced by Green Acres Baptist Church where she goes to church with her testimony. God used this time that would seem like an imprisonment of her health for her to be a witness to those. Probably, I'm, I'm thinking hundreds, if not more, watch that video. Now, I'm sure there's other ways God has used that. But that's hard to do. That's hard to think of when you're in it. And it's really hard, like for Mary, to see that happening. But what an encouragement to know that her seeming imprisonment is what has allowed her to reach so many. 
So, we're going to talk about Epaphroditus now. Everybody say, just get it out of your system. Epaphroditus. Okay. <laughs> we're going to uh, talk about him. And in his Paul's letter to the Philippians, by the way, Paul spent 10 years with the Philippians at the church in Philippi. Anyone remember Lydia? When we talked about Lydia? Anyone remember the fortune teller? Why Paul and Silas got thrown into jail because they... They took the demons out of the fortune teller. Anyone remember um, the jailer that then came to Christ? Remember we talked about all this when we talked about Lydia that night. Those people, Lydia, the fortune teller, and the jailer, went to church with Epaphroditus and Paul when he was a missionary there. And so Epaphroditus was part of that church, the church in Philippi. Now Philippi was one of the first cities that the gospel was shared in. And it was the home of the early one of the early churches. We know this because we also found out when we talked about Lydia that she was the first convert in Europe for the gospel, if you'll remember that. Now, there are only two mentions of Epaphroditus in the scripture. And they are both in Philippians, and we're going to read them both tonight. Here's an interesting fact. Epaphroditus was probably not led to faith by Paul himself because Paul calls him, we're going to read it, his brother in Christ, not his son in Christ. When you would say son in Christ, that meant, or daughter in Christ, I'm sorry, that meant that that is someone you had shared and led to, to Christ, to belief in the gospel. When you said brother in Christ or sister in Christ, that was someone who someone else had led and they were just your brother or sister in Christ. Just a little interesting tidbit there. Now, <laughs> Epaphroditus' name is of pagan origin. I want this is going to be important a little while later, so I want you to remember about his name. His name means belonging to Aphrodite. Now, does anyone remember who Aphrodite is? A goddess of love, fertility, sex. Um, it also says beauty, passion, procreation. And what's funny is when I was getting ready for this, Riley likes to read, my daughter Riley likes to read, um, these, uh, oh, I won't be able to remember his name. Rick Riordan? Yes, Rick Riordan. He talks a lot about the Greek gods, and of course I've had the conversation with her. We know that those aren't real. Those are all make-believe, but she just likes to get into Greek mythology and things, and so she knew all about Aphrodite. Hopefully not the part that I don't you know, want her to know much about yet at 13, but she knows that she's the she was known as the goddess of love. Of course, she's not real, okay? But Aphrodite, or I mean Epaphroditus, his name meant belonging to Aphrodite. And this was a very common name, which I thought was strange, but it's a very common name. A lot of times it was given, and it, it was like a handsome person, you know, related to Aphrodite. Now, you can hear, can you hear Epaphroditus? Can you hear her name in there? Yeah. Okay. I want to read this because I thought it was so amazing. Such is the power of the gospel that a man is set free from dead paganism to serve the living God. When Epaphroditus received the gospel, he was belonging to Jesus, not belonging to Aphrodite. And the idol of Aphrodite had no more claim on him. It reminds me of the song we shared, You Changed My Name, that you shared that night. Regardless of his name, he was now known as belonging to Jesus. The new birth trumped the birth name. The new birth trumped the birth name. See, our name was lost. Our name was sin. Our name was broken. Our name was many other things you could say. But our birth in our new birth into Christ, when we accepted Christ into our hearts, our new birth trumped everything we once were. Isn't that beautiful? Now I want y'all to remember about Ephra, 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 that's hard to say, Epaphroditus' name, because we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Now, let's go ahead and look at Philippians 2, 25 through 30, now that you've got some good background, and let's hear what Paul's letter, and this portion of his letter, is saying to the church in Philippi. We're going to start in verse 25. So find Philippians 2, 25. 
and we're going to go to 30. But I considered it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier, as well as your messenger and minister to my need, since he had been longing for all of you and was distressed because you heard that he was sick. Indeed, he was so sick that he nearly died. However, God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but also on me, so that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. For this reason, I am very eager to send him, so that you may rejoice again when you see him, and I may be less anxious. Therefore, welcome him in the Lord with great joy, and hold people like him in honor, because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to make up what was lacking in your ministry to me. Let's look at this now. Paul begins by telling the end of the story. You kind of have to, you, you get the end and then you kind of find out why it was that way. In verse 25 that we just read, he is sending Epaphroditus back to the church of Philippi. He even says it was necessary to do so. Did you see that in verse 25? I considered it necessary. We'll see why it was necessary in a bit. Then Paul describes his relationship to Epaphroditus in three ways. What was the first way he described his relationship to Epaphroditus? Brother. His brother. So here we see that he was related through Christ and a fellow missionary. Okay, they were brothers in Christ. What was the second way? He was a fellow worker. Fellow worker or co-worker. They were both laboring for the gospel to be spread. Okay, they were both laboring for the same thing. And what was the third way? Fellow soldier. They were both giving all they had to fight the good fight of faith in Jesus Christ. And by the way, some of the commentaries think that Epaphroditus was actually a soldier before he was a missionary with Paul. So you can look that up more if you want to. Now, right after that, in verse 25, or still in verse 25, right after he says, He's my brother, my co-worker, and my fellow soldier. Then Paul's telling of what Epaphroditus' relationship is to the church in Philippi. What does he say that their first relationship is? He was their messenger. messenger. That means he was a delegate of the Christian community at Philippi. He was a delegate of their church. He was, a, he was sent, bringing something from them to Paul to encourage their brother Paul who was in prison. And what was the second thing he related to the church? Minister. minister. He brought, he was a minister to Paul's need. Now what they think that was is that he brought a monetary gift to Paul. Most likely money to help him <coughs> pay the rent on that insula that we talked about. Because you see, probably Dr. Luke had told the church in Philippi that the missionaries had had a shipwreck on Malta. That had happened before. You can look it up later if you want to. And they had lost everything. And also, he had probably told them how high the rent was in Rome. It was very high rent. Okay? So, we know that um, he was sent as a messenger and to minister to Paul's need. Now, look again at verse 26. It says, Epaphroditus was longing for all of his brothers and sisters in Philippi. Why? Well, he knew, it's, it says here in a little bit, he knew that they had heard that he had been sick. Now remember, you couldn't, they could, he couldn't send a quick Facebook message saying, I'm okay now. He couldn't, he couldn't make a phone call. Um, they didn't even have the Pony, Pony Express. No, they didn't have snail mail, nothing. And you'll see about his trip in a little bit, why the news didn't go easily to them to say, hey, he's okay now. In fact, the letter that Paul was writing was going to be sent with Epaphroditus himself back to Philippi, okay? So he was going to deliver the news himself. If they didn't just see him, they would see in the letter, you know, he's okay. The letter says I'm okay. I'm okay. Okay. Um, then the beginning of verse 27 tells us that Epaphroditus had become so sick that he almost died. Well, no wonder uh, many people, many um, writers um, think that he was probably made sick on the trip there. Listen to a few details I learned about this trip 
and tell me if you'd like to take a trip like this. Now, Miss Marie told me at dinner tonight that she's going to be taking a month-long trip going around and visiting her different uh, grandchildren. And she said, I don't know if I, I hope you don't mind me sharing, Marie, but she said, I don't know if I, she's a little worried because she doesn't like being away from home for very many days and she's going to be gone a whole month. We're going to miss her. But um, she's going to have a good time. But can you imagine this trip, Miss Marie? Listen to this. Well, number one, we found out that he did take others with him because any time that they were delivering or uh, taking money to someone, they would always have others with them, whether it be servants, other missionaries. So he had other people with him, most likely. Um, common in the early church, safety in numbers. You know, you have the money with you. But listen to his trip. The first leg of his trip was a 367 Roman mile walk. That in itself, you could say a three mile walk. And, I, and so then I had to say, well, why does it say Roman mile? That must be a lot less than what we're used to of a mile, right? No, it's more than a mile. So he took probably close to a 400 mile walk on the Via Ignatia Road from Philippi. Remember, he was in the church in Philippian, the Philippian church, from Philippi to the Dorachium on the Adriatic, to Dorachium, the city of Dorachium, on the Adriatic Sea. Then when he got to the sea, he crossed the sea by ship, got over to a place called Brundusium, and then he had to go another 360 Roman miles walk down the Via Appian Road to Rome. So I totaled that up. That's a total of about 729 Roman miles. So probably about 800 of our miles. It took him about 57 days, they think, which approximately adds up to about 12 miles a day by foot. With And remember, he had to rest on each of the Lord's days. So that took a few, you know, because they didn't do anything on the Sabbath. So whether on the trip, which very well could have made him very sick, or shortly after arriving in Rome, Epaphroditus had given of himself so greatly that he was a very sick man. This journey had to have taken a lot out of anyone who took it, y'all. Anyone. He gave of his body, his physical self, to go and serve and minister to Paul. But after he became sick, God stepped in. Look at the last part of verse 27 again. Now, let's just do the whole verse. Indeed, he was so sick that he nearly died. I love that word. However, God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but also on me. Who's talking? Paul. So that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. He, or suffering upon suffering, was another way to put it. Um, Paul, it, it would have really hurt Paul. Remember, he had worked with Epaphroditus for probably 10 years in Philippi. So it would have really hurt him if Epaphroditus had come to minister to him and got so sick and had died. So he said he had mercy on him and he also had mercy on me because I would have had suffering upon suffering had that happened. Now, look at verse 28 again. For this reason, I am very eager to send him so that you may rejoice again when you see him and I may be less anxious. Now, Paul said it was necessary in that first verse 25 we read to send Epaphroditus back to the church in Philippi. Now he says in verse 28 that he's very eager to send him back. So it was necessary and Paul was very eager to send him back. Why? So that the, it, it, it says it right there. So that the church would once again be full of joy and so that Paul would be less anxious. Why again? Well, for the church, the reason he wanted to send him back was probably part of the reason was the church had two sisters in their congregation, Judea and Sitke. Sitke, it's hard to say. They were arguing and causing deep divisions. So you don't ever want anyone to call you a Judea or a Sitke, okay? Getting Epaphroditus back would encourage the church and Paul's letter, delivered by the hand of Epaphroditus himself, would, as I said earlier, would say, I'm okay. See, I'm okay. So that would encourage them. 
And the reason Paul, he didn't want to have suffering upon suffering, but also at this time, Paul was preparing his defense to get out of prison. He was spending a lot of time, obviously, ministering to others who were coming in and teaching and all that, but he was also at the same time preparing a defense because he had a trial coming up uh, to possibly free him. So he was very busy and consumed with, within his thoughts and his energy, and I think part of this is he just didn't need anything else to worry about right now. I'm going to send Epaphroditus on back to y'all. Now think about it. Before Epaphroditus got there, he was sick, almost died, and now he's going to take that track back. Can you imagine? Now, look at verses 29 and 30 again. Let's just read them again. Therefore, welcome him in the Lord with great joy, and hold people like him in honor, because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to make up what was lacking in your ministry to me. Now, it seems like Paul here is kind of feeling the need to remind the church to welcome Epaphroditus back. Why would he need to remind the church to act in that way? Well, probably because Paul was aware that some of the people in the church in Philippi would say, you know, while some were so happy to see him and that Epaphroditus was well, some in the church might have felt like, where, what are you doing back? You were supposed to go and minister to Paul. Why are you back already? And so Paul knew that, and he wanted to remind the church that Epaphroditus had fulfilled what he said, what they sent him to do. He had delivered their gift, and I love this. One of the commentators, um, a man named Hawthorne, you may have read some of his commentary before, he said this about Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus was no coward. But a courageous person willing to take enormous risks, ready to play with very high stakes in order to come to the aid of a person in need. He did not save his life, but rather hazarded it to do for Paul and the cause of Christ what other Philippian Christians did not or could not do. Let me read that last sentence again. Y'all just really hone in on it. Epaphroditus did not save his life, but rather hazarded it to do for Paul and for the cause of Christ what other Philippian Christians did not or could not do. Paul Thorne, this commentator, goes on to explain this neat little thing. And I was telling Riley about this the other day. I like to tell her little tidbits about things, especially if it's such you're interested in. So remember about his name. Right? He was named after who? <laughs> Aphrodite. Hawthorne goes on to explain that the Greek phrase that is translated, not regarding him, I don't know what that verb is. <laughs> I, I'm going to pretend that it's one. Amen! 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 That's what we're going to do. Y'all pretend that too, okay? Now, when it stops, you're going to say, mm, Amy, that wasn't good. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> but that phrase, um, let me find it real quick, where it says, um, in verse 30, it says, because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life, or another way you can say that phrase is not regarding his own life, that's a gambling term. That's a gambling term used by the apostle. He's, he's using that phrase. Paul is using it. Because you see, a Greek gambler before he would roll the dice. What do we say before we, I, I don't gamble, but I've, heard, I've seen it on television shows. What do they say when they roll the dice? Show me the money. Show me the money, or baby needs a new pair of shoes, or snake eyes, or what? Seven times 11. Okay, I didn't know that one, seven times 11. Whatever you do, what they would say, and I have to look at it to say it, because it's not Epaphroditus, but it's very close, it's Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus, and then they do it. And what they're saying is, I'm a favorite of Aphrodite, be good on me, be good to me. Come on, dice, I'm a favorite of Aphrodite. <laughs> so Paul uses that phrase, not regarding his life, which is a term that Greek gamblers used, meaning a favorite of Aphrodite. And he made a pun on Epaphroditus' name. 
He made a pun on his name. Truly the dice were loaded when Epaphroditus put his life on the line for the Lord's work. And instead of invoking Aphrodite, he invoked who? The true and living God, Jesus. And God was merciful to Epaphroditus and healed him. Isn't that cool? Paul used a gambling term, was a play on words on his name to mean, yeah, he didn't need this. He had, the, he had the dice loaded. He had God on his side. Now, at the very end of verse 30, Paul concludes this section by stating um, that Epaphroditus risked his life to what? To supply what was lacking in your service toward me. The Greek here, it kind of sounded harsh to me when I first read it. Like, well, what you weren't willing to do, Epaphroditus did. That's not what Paul meant here. The Greek does not translate that way. What it's basically saying is, what you can't do for me 720 miles away, Epaphroditus came and fulfilled. Okay? That's what it means. He did for me what you couldn't do for me, not what you weren't willing to do for me. Obviously, they were willing. They sent someone. And the cost and expense of the, the gift itself was something. And by the way, the church in Philippi had been um, supporting Paul for, for a long time in his mission work. Now, I want to go through a few applications that we can get from the life of Epaphrodite, and then I'm going to sing you all the song that I think would be his song. The first application is serving is selfless. <clears throat> when we consider the Christian life, do we ask ourselves, what's in it for me? Or do we ask ourselves, how can I be of service to others? You see, Epaphroditus sought to serve other people. And maybe he was the one that Isaac Watts, the poet, had in mind when he penned these words. Am I a soldier of the cross? That bird. Oh, you said a bird? Get on out of here. <laughs> and he said, like, what? It sounds like a cell phone going off, but it's a bird. Okay. Am I a soldier of the cross, a follower of the Lamb? And shall I fear to own his cause or blush to speak his name? Must I be carried to the skies on flowery beds of ease while others fought to win the prize and sailed through bloody seas? Are there no foes for me to face? Must I not stem the flood? Is this vile world a friend to grace to help me on to God? Sure, I must fight if I would reign. Increase my courage, Lord. I'll bear the toil, endure the pain, supported by thy word. I think that maybe this poet had Epaphroditus in mind when he wrote this, a soldier of the cross, because it's not always easy to put yourself in a position of service. In fact, most of the time it's not. Service is selfless. The second thing I think we can learn from Epaphroditus is, and this is a hard one, but serving does not exclude you or me from suffering. It just doesn't. Here, Epaphroditus is doing something great, something meaningful, something of service to God, and he almost dies. But see, God is sovereign. He could have kept Epaphroditus from even ever becoming ill, but in God's sovereign wisdom and choice, he chose not to. And that's hard to accept sometimes. Maybe not as hard for even ourselves as it is to accept for our loved ones and our friends. Listen to this. Someone wrote this. There is a prevailing myth out there that if we just love Jesus enough, he'll take all of our problems away. And it will be nothing but rainbows and unicorns. So when life gets tough, we figure we must be doing something wrong or God doesn't love us that much. But that, ladies, is not how God works. Suffering has a purpose and serving doesn't exclude you from suffering. The third thing I think we can get from his life is value in the kingdom will always spring from community. I'm going to say that again. That's important. That's important to me as your pastor's wife, that value in the kingdom will always spring from community. 
Why did Epaphroditus even make the scripture? How did he make the cut of getting in the scripture? Well, it's because he was so vital to the community in Philippi. They were genuinely concerned about him. He had spent years faithfully serving, leading, helping, teaching. The church at Philippi was his family, just like the church at Mount Carmel is yours. So don't drop from Christian community, a.k.a. our church and our family here, when life seems too busy or when life seems too hard. Because value in the kingdom, once again, will always spring from community. It's where we are equipped and where we're encouraged to serve him. Do you agree with that? What way do you agree with that? I'm going to give you all a minute to talk about that. What way, in what way do you agree with that? Repeat the question. <laughs> value in the kingdom will always spring from community. In other words, if you're going to have value in the kingdom, you can go out there and try it on your own. But true value in the kingdom will spring from your time that you spent in community with God's people. Agree or disagree? Yes. Why? Who do you know that's gone out on their own and with no, but no help and done any good for the kingdom? Paul himself needed Epaphroditus to come. Why Paul's the best missionary I've ever known about. Why did he create us to work alone? No, absolutely he wouldn't. He created us to be together, the body of Christ. You're a thumb, I'm a toe. <laughs> you know, we're all different parts of that body. We all serve different functions. Well, and I think it, if we, and as a group, mm -hmm. other people see you and they want to know, you know, what's, what's cool. going on with that group, you know? Absolutely, I agree with that too. It's, it's, for, it's, it's a good aroma to people, it, and it, it, it looks good to people, and because it is good. What else? The Bible says, forsake not the gathering together. Forsake not the assembling of yourself together. That's right. It's a, it's a commandment from God. Anything else? You get strength. Hmm? You get the strength. Oh, my goodness, you get so much strength. Tell me that y'all don't go away feeling better after every time you've been at church. Now, Miss Ann, you, last Sunday night when you came to church, you had tears in your eyes saying how much it meant to you to be back at church. Because it's your community. It's your place. And we've had this strange pandemic going on. And we remained together in so many ways. We did the best we could, didn't we, y'all? But isn't it wonderful? And I know uh, Ms. Delight's back there. Mount Carmel is my family. That's oh, right. Hey. And these women here. <laughs> You're here. These <laughs> women here. <laughs> You're a part of her family. Like, You're also her right actual here. blood family. But, <laughs> but guess what? We are. We're just as much family as Amber is to you. Exactly. We really are. Exactly. I think, when, I think it's when we forget that, that churches run into trouble. We have to love each other like we love our own families because no good service comes without springing forth from community. This is exciting, ladies. And I shared about this a few weeks ago when we talked about, I can't remember who it was we talked about, and I talked about the community and our sisters. It was Ruth, when we talked about Ruth um, and Naomi. We are each other's sisters in Christ. We've got to lift each other up. We've got to meet each other. We've got to find people who are new or who, who maybe have been here all these years but have never connected with someone. We've got to be there for each other and love on each other. Don't just stick with the same people you've always stuck with. You know? Let's look. I'm going to show y'all. I told y'all that Epaphroditus was mentioned twice in Philippians. Look. Skip over to chapter 4, verse 18. This is the other place he's mentioned. Of course, Paul is still speaking this whole uh, book of Philippians is to the church in Philippi. And he says in 4.18, But I have received everything in half. Is that right? Full. In full. But I have received everything in full, and I have an abundance. Y'all, he's talking from prison. I am fully supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you provided, a fragrant offering, a 
an acceptable sacrifice pleasing to God. I don't know about you, but I want to also be a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice and pleasing to God. Is that where you want to be, ladies? Is that where your heart is? I hope so. I want to read, uh, sing you this song and uh, my little speaker, sorry, I left it at home. I thought I had it in my bag and I realized the last minute I don't, but I hope you can hear this okay, but at least you'll be able to hear the words to this song. This is a song I've sang for years and years, but it's not a real well-known song. And I like that because I want you to be able to hear the words. And I hope that you will make this your prayer tonight. In fact, as long as you promise not to fall asleep, <laughs> it's been a long day. If you want to close your eyes and make this your prayer, that's fine. But it's called Body, Soul, and Spirit. I hope this is all of our prayers. Sorry, it's not very loud. The struggle is so real, it rages on in me. Torn between your perfect will and where flesh wants to leave. It's that way every moment, it has been since the fall. The battles leave me longing to yield my all. Body, soul, and spirit committed to you, Lord. Centered in your presence more and more. Heaven's holy purpose is what I'm living for. Body, soul, and spirit, I'm yours. Renew this mind within, set my thoughts on things above. An instrument of righteousness, a vessel of your love. And take this mortal body, a living sacrifice. Every fiber of my being, crucified with Christ. Body, soul, and spirit committed to you, Lord. Centered in your presence more and more. And heaven's holy purpose is what I'm living for. Body, soul, and spirit, I'm yours. that soldier of Christ like Epaphrodite Lord help us to be willing to go when you call be willing to step out of our comfort zone Lord I hope you don't send me on a 720 mile journey by foot but God if you told me to I pray that I'd be willing but Lord whatever you do call me to I pray Lord that I would give my body, soul, and spirit. And I pray that for every single one of the women in this in this room tonight. We love you, Lord, and I pray that you would continue to speak to us as we leave here tonight. We pray in your name. Amen.
It's been so great to see y'all tonight. Great group. My goodness. Yes.